Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Bava Kamadaf Kuf Dalid. Um, I want to start with a quick review of where we were. So we started with our Mishnah. Our Mishnah talks about if somebody, and now I have a better explanation of this Shaliach and the Mishnah, the Shaliach Beitin. I will explain where I left off with the question, left us with a question yesterday when we read the Mishnah. Um, I'll explain that as well. So Hagozelet Chaveiro Shavet Pruta. I'm going back for one quick minute to the Mishnah and Daf Kuf Gimel. If somebody steals more than a shepherd pruta, I'm not going to get into that right now, vinishbalo, and then takes an oath, I didn't steal. And then, now it doesn't say this, but the obvious is then admit, and that we talked about yesterday, based on the Rashi that I brought on the study guide yesterday, um, the Rashi on the Psukim and the Torah there, where we take the vidoy, the admission that comes up in Bamibar, and we put it back on that section in Vayikra, we say they're talking about the same thing, and they combine together. So now, basically, I steal from you, and then I admit that I, I, I swear falsely and I say I did not steal, then I admit that I stole. I now, if you remember, a few things happen, right? I now have to pay not only the value of the item, also the Chomesh, a fifth payment, and the Asham Gzelot. Now, until now, it seems like, and we're going to change this a little bit today, that the fifth payment and the Asham Gzelot, because it's only when I admit, it's dealing with a different issue. The Karen goes back to the person I stole from as compensation. But we think now, and again, we're going to change this a little bit, so I'm always hesitant to say things that we're going to change, but right now it seems like the Chomesh, the added fifth, because it only comes when I swear falsely and then confess, sounds like that and the Asham are for my own atonement purposes, okay? Later on in the death, we're going to split between the Korban, which is clearly for atonement purposes, and the Chomesh, which is actually also compensation to the person who I stole from. And in addition... We're going to be stricter with me that in this kind of a case, I have to make sure to get it to the person I stole it from wherever they live, even if they live far away. Then the Mishnah said, well, you can't, I can't give it to your son. I can't give it to your messenger. That's not going to work. Today, we're going to deal a lot with the whole messenger thing. Why wouldn't that work? Or not that it doesn't work, but the point is, and and here also, it, it doesn't say all this, but the commentaries say, what this really means is until, there, there's really two meanings. Number one, until it gets to you, I can't bring my Asham Zelot. I can't go ask for atonement until I've done completely what I need to do here, which is get the money back to you, which again, we're going to learn is only the Karen, not the Chomesh. And then, which is the principle, not the extra added fifth. And also it means that if I sent it with your son or your messenger, and or whoever it is, your daughter, it doesn't matter. I send it with someone to you. Until it gets to you, I'm responsible. That means, today we're going to get into this a lot, which is what if I send it and they get mugged on the way and the money's gone or the money gets lost or something happens to it on the way. Until it gets to you, it's not a done deal. This is going to be a little similar to what we learned about a get. Until the get gets to the wife, it's not good. Now, we did learn there that there's shaliach l'holacha and shaliach l'kabalah. What's that? If you remember, there's a shaliach the husband can appoint to send the get to someone. And there's a shaliach that the woman can appoint to accept the get on her behalf. Now, if she sends a shaliach, once the shaliach gets the get, it's as if she got the get. So we're going to have to figure out here why if you send a shaliach to get your stolen item, is it not like you actually got the stolen item back? So the mission makes it pretty clear that it's not. Okay, we're going to have to discuss this. Then it says, you can, though, give it to a shaliach beitin. And we said, well, how could you give it to a shaliach beitin? Okay, right, you can give it to a court-appointed shaliach. If you can't give it to a shaliach, you have to actually give it in hand. How can you do this? So a lot of the commentaries say that this is talking about a case when <coughs> it's too expensive for me to go spend the money to get it back to you compared to the value of the item stolen. And therefore, second, and therefore, if it's too expensive, in that case, there is some in-between solution, which is give it to a messenger of the court, and then, and then really the point is, I can then go bring my sacrifice. I don't have to wait till it gets to you, till someone spends the money to get the, you know, FedEx or something or get it to you wherever you live. <coughs> now, the problem that the Gemara said was, the first thing they said is, it says here, Nishma, you take an oath, which means that only if you take an oath is this the case that you have to get it all the way to the Nixal. But if you didn't take an oath, right, the one you stole from, if you didn't take an oath, then you don't have to. Again, what does that mean? You can just say, okay, here's a stolen item. It's here. Come get it. Okay? Or give it to a messenger or whatever it is. It's a much easier process. No. And that basically, 
I'm, I'm okay as long as I say, here's the stolen item, even if I don't actually give it and return it to you. So, right, as long as, as you know it's there. So now they say this is a big problem because it doesn't match Rabbi Kiva or Rabbi Tarfon who have this argument in a case in Yavamot in Kufu Kadam Abet where I stole from someone I don't know who I stole from. There's five potential people who all claim it was them. According to Rabbi Tarfon, I just put the money down and that's it. It doesn't have to get to the nigza. And according to Rabbi Kiva, I have to pay each of them because it has to get to the nigza. Now, it seems like they didn't distinguish Shavua, no Shavua, like our Mishnah did. So the Mishnah matches neither opinion. To which we tried to suggest yesterday, no, maybe the, the, the Mishnah, Yavamo there, is only talking about in a case where Nishba. And if they didn't take an oath, right, if this was a case where they got caught stealing, but it wasn't that there was an oath made and, and denied, right, then if there was an oath made, okay, then you would have to return to everybody, Rabbi Kiva would say. But if there was no oath, then you don't have to. So, sorry, I, I think I might have said flip that. I'm, I'm not sure if I said something there wrong, but let me just clarify. When there's the five people and there's an argument about them, it's a case where there was an oath. And then Rabbi Kiva would match our Mishnah. In the case of an oath, you have to get it back to the people who you stole it from. And that's what you're going to have to. In this case, it's going to be multiple people you're going to have to give to out of a doubt. But we rejected that. Can't be that they, they argue in this case of a shvua, particularly and not when there's no shvua, because we saw Rabbi Kiva talking about cases where there was no shvua, and we particularly ended with this chassid case, where for sure he didn't lie falsely under oath because he was a chassid, and yet Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Tarfon disagree. So they must be at least also, dis right, they must be disagreeing about a case of not a shvua, maybe also, but definitely yes, in a case of not a shvua, so you can't match Rabbi Kiva. So if you want to say now the flip, Maybe their argument was only in a case where there is no oath. And maybe Rabbi Tarfon would agree that if there was an oath and the guy lied falsely, he would actually have to return the money to everybody. And that's what we're going to suggest now. So starting five or six lines from the bottom, Elelo Olam Rabbi Tarfon here, the bottom of yesterday's stuff. Umode Rabbi Tarfon hechad ishtiva. Maybe it really is Rabbi Tarfon. And Rabbi Tarfon is only arguing with Rabbi Kiva in the case where he didn't take an oath. And then, which would match those two sources we brought as contradiction yesterday. But Rabbi Tarfon, in a case where you took an oath, like our Mishnah, would agree that you would have to return it to that person. And in which case, in the Yavamo case, you'd have to give to all five people if you had denied the theft. Because it makes sense, right? It's more strict if you deny the theft. right? Because you've already, by the way, if you want to learn more about why we take it so seriously when you take an oath, in, in on second thought this week of Rabbi Yifi Clymer, which went up yesterday, she talks all about the seriousness of oaths, right? Oaths were taken in the name of God, and it's much more serious and much more severe, and she talks from a more philosophical perspective about oaths, and it's going to be a topic we're going to cover for the next number of days, so worth listening to her she or. So now we're going to say the following. My time. So why would he agree in a case where there was an oath? Well, simply because the, the proof pasuk of yesterday of Rabbi Akiva, who will use for his proof according to this explanation. The pasuk says, you're supposed to return it to the one you took it from, right? On the day you bring Shmato, right? When you bring your Korban Asham, which means you have to return it to him. What's that case? It's a case of an oath. So Rabbi, Yishma, um, Rabbi Tarfon will understand that pasuk simply as as a as as it's simple reading, you take an oath, you have to return it. But if you didn't take an oath, then you can just put it in the middle and you know be done with it. The Rabbi Akiva. So what will Rabbi Akiva say? Because he's going to say now he has to disagree about something, right? He disagrees in a case of no oath. In no oath, he says you still have to uh, return to everybody. Why would he say that? The Torah was talking about with an oath, you have to give back directly to the person you stole from, in which case, in this case, you'd have to give to all five people. But if there's no oath, well, we're going to penalize you anyway, because you still stole and you don't know who you stole from, and we're going to penalize you because you're a thief. If you're Rabbi Tarfon, now they're going to say, wait, something doesn't work here. Why? Okay, this is something we talked about, and I quoted you that Rashi on the Torah. There's no way that Shvua and the whole thing with the Asham Gazelod and the Chomesh is without admission. It all is when you admit, okay? It's not just that you took an oath. It's that you took an oath and then admitted that you lied. And what's the whole, why does that add something? Because when you admit that you lie, that adds this whole element of now I need atonement. Okay, why is this important? Well then, 
my area nishba. What we're saying is the issue of Rabbi Yishmael here is he distinguishes between nishba and lo nishba. And the issue of our Mishnah is this distinction between nishba and lo nishba. So why would it say nishba in our Mishnah? Afilu belo shfuanami. Well, Rabbi Tarfon, and we're going to prove it. The issue with Rabbi Tarfon is all about did I admit or not admit? It has nothing to do with did I take a shvu or not. We thought if I took a shvu, it's much more severe and because of that. But he says the whole issue actually, Rabbi Tarfon agrees in a case, and we're going to see it right now, where you didn't take an oath, but you admitted that you're also going to have to pay, that then you're going to have to pay each person. And then we're not going to be able to say, Rabbi Yishmael distinguishes nishba lo nishba. His distinction is hoda lo hoda. And let's see it inside. Titania modea Rabbi Tarfon ba'omer l'shnayim, gazal t'yecha mikem ane ve'eni odea ez mikem. Rabbi Tarfon says, if you go over, now you didn't take an oath here. You just walk over to two people and you said, listen, I want to, I feel bad. I want to repent. I stole from one of you. I just don't know which one of you. According to Rabbi Tarfon, he agrees with Rabbi Akiva in that case. No ten lezem mane u lezem mane. He has to give each one. Shikfar hodami piatzmo, because he had this admission. He admitted. So now we can't say that Rabbi Yishmael, I'm sorry, I keep saying Rabbi Yishmael because Rabbi Yishmael was excused with Rabbi Akiva. I'm sorry. Rabbi Tarfon and Rabbi Akiva are clearly arguing in, right? In, they're clearly, they will agree in which case, not in the case of Nishba, right? In other words, we tried to say that Rabbi Yishmael, our mission that distinguished Nishba and Lo Nishba would be Rabbi Yishmael because he distinguishes. But now we see he doesn't distinguish nishba lo nishma. He distinguishes hoda lo hoda. Did you confess or not confess? Not whether you took an oath or not an oath. So, and that's clear from Rabbi Tarfa from what he says in this other brayta. So this falls flat. This answer because we can't distinguish nishba lo nishba. It doesn't work. So now comes Rav and he's basically going to say, I don't even know why you started comparing our machlok, our mishnah to Rabbi Tarfa and Rabbi Akiva. Totally different issue. Why is it a totally different issue? Because the two situations are totally different. What's the main difference? You know who you stole from in our Mishnah. The mission, you don't know who you stole from. Two totally different cases. Now, he's only going to explain our case, so I'll just say it very simply. Rabbi Yishmael and Rabbi Kiva, as we thought in the beginning, they argue nishba lo nishba. It doesn't make a difference. Rabbi Tarfon thinks you have to give back the money only to one, one time the money. Rabbi Akiva thinks you have to give back to everybody. Now, and maybe Rabbi, right, Rabbi Tarfo makes this distinction, hoda lo hoda, okay? But the basic case here of they accuse you and it wasn't that you admitted, okay? They just accused you. It doesn't matter whether you took an oath, didn't take an oath. That's not relevant. They argue no matter what. Our Mishnah, though, is a different case. I know who I stole from. Now I need to return the money. Do I need to return it directly to the person or is it enough for me to say, here, come take the money? And that's because, and here comes the interesting conceptual part. There's two elements going on. When I know who I stole from, number one, I need to get them back the money because I need to compensate them for what I stole. Number two, if I take an oath, there's an additional, and I take an oath and I confess to that taking that oath, there's the additional element of atonement. And the way they're going to explain it is it's atonement for God, basically. It's between me and God. So now they're going to say the following. Okay, since I knew who I stole from, and I admitted, since I can return the money to the person, meaning that I know who I need to return the money to, as opposed to the other issue, which is what do you do when you don't know who you stole from? That's a totally separate issue. Here I know who the money is supposed to be returned to. Let's say I steal from you. Once... I admit, at this point, I can just say to you, listen, the money's in my property. Come get it. Okay, theory. And, and what they're really saying is here, de amarle, you are basically saying to me, you li biadecha. Okay, when I get to Renana and I'm, I'm, I'm in the town, I'll come get it from your house. That's what you say to me. Okay, because you know that I stole from you. What's the worst part of theft? You usually don't know who stole from you. Once you know who stole from you, so you know who you can collect it from. So you're fine with that. And then... I can move on, basically. But it's going to depend on whether nishba or lo nishba. So basically, it's like I have your, a picadon in my house of yours. It's like I now have your item. It's sitting on my shelf waiting for you to come pick it up. That's fine, but only if, right? What's our Mishnah? Our Mishnah says, if I took an oath and then admitted, that's not enough, right? I have to get it to your house. 
Hilkach nishba. So if I didn't take an oath, I'm okay, because all I have to do is get it back to you. And as soon as you say, it's fine, I know it's in your house, I'm done, basically. It's just sitting in my house with your name on. But if I took an oath, where it's much more severe, and I took an oath in the name of God, and now I have to deal with God, well, right, Rosh even says it, Kedei Latzei Yidei Shamayim. Okay, I want to deal with the heavens. That's a whole different story. It doesn't matter if you say to me, okay, I know it's in your, in your house. I'll go get it from you when I'm there next. Since I need atonement, it's not good enough until you actually receive it. And therefore, But as I already said, if I didn't take an oath, then it's like I have a picadon. It's like something of yours in my house that I'm watching over. Okay, until you pick it up. So now we have this, I'll just do a quick summary. If you don't know who you stole from, then we get into this Machlok of Rabbi Tarfa, Rabbi Kiva, which is irrelevant whether I, I took an oath, I didn't take an oath. Okay, that's not a relevant factor. If we know who the thief is, there's two tracks. Either I took an oath, and then that track splits into two, which is either I, um, one second, right, then Okay, if I took an oath, I have to actually get it all the way to you in Madai, unless it's too much money to get there, in which case I can put it in a court, a shaliach of a court, right? A, a court-appointed messenger. If I didn't take an oath, then I could just leave it in my house for you to get. Okay, that's a summary of what we said so far, in which case the two machlokot have nothing to do with each other. So what we did on this whole last amud really becomes irrelevant. We just erase it because there was no reason to try to reconcile our Mishnah with the Mishnah in Yuvamo because they're two totally different cases. Now we're going to go back to the Mishnah where it says, lo yitain lo lebeno velo lishlucho. Okay, which really means that they're not going to assume responsibility. If you gave it to their son or a shaliach, it's not as if, right, even if it's their shaliach, it's not as if you gave it back to them, right? Different from, let's say, or maybe we're going to talk about this, like the get case, where if she appoints, a, a, a the woman appoints a shaliach to get her get, as soon as it gets to the shaliach, it's as if she's divorced. Now, itmar. Now we're going to move off topic, why are we here? Because we're going to bring in something else. We're not talking here about a, a thief. We're talking about a regular creditor who's owed money by a debtor. Okay, let's just take a loan, for example. And we're going to talk about responsibility when we return the money. Okay, so let's say um, Ruth owes Naomi money and Ruth sends the money with a shaliach that Naomi appointed. Okay, so. How are we going to, what are we going to do here? We're going to show there's a machlog between Rav Chista and Rabbah and about who's responsible. And we're then going to bring our Mishnah as a difficulty. We're going to bring actually first a Mishnah above Bava as a difficulty on Rav Chista and then our Mishnah as a difficulty. And then we're going to resolve it and then we're going to see that there's other Amora even in Israel that held like Rav Chista as well. That's the structure for right now. Itmar. Shaliach sha'asa'o be'edim. So if Naomi has money that Ruth owes her, Okay, whether it's a picadon, let's say she gave her something to watch, or it's a loan. And Naomi appoints a messenger to get it from an agent to get it from Ruth, but appoints the agent with witnesses. So comes Rav Chista and says, have a shaliach. This is a shaliach for all intents and purposes. As soon as Ruth gives it to the messenger, she's done. Something happens to the money on the way. doesn't matter. It's as if she returned it already. Rabbi Amar lo have shaliach. Rabbi says, no way, no how. So let's explain why. What was the point of, of Naomi appointing this agent in front of witnesses if not to say these witnesses are going to assume responsibility? What she really meant to say was like this. Why did she do witnesses? Well, she wanted Ruth to know that this person I appointed as an agent is a very responsible person. If you want to rely on them to get me the money back, great. Rely on them. I, I think they're responsible. If you want to give them the money, go for it. Okay, Naomi's trying to get the money back from Ruth. She can't go herself for whatever reason. Maybe she's elderly. Maybe she can't do the traveling, whatever it is. So she wants to make Ruth's life easier to get the money back. And she wants her money back, basically. So she appoints this messenger with witnesses hoping that Ruth will trust the witness enough to hope it will get there. All I can think about in this whole sugya is making secure online payments, right? You'll only make a payment online if it's a secure transaction. You're not going to do it if it's some, you know, insecure transaction thing, or you might by accident, right? And then you'll regret it because something will happen, you're going to have to pay twice. So basically, 
what Naomi's saying is, this is a secure way of getting the money back to me, right? Of course, no guarantees, because we don't know. But, and, and then she's basically not assuming any responsibility, according to Rabbi. She's just saying, I think you can do it in this way and you'll be okay. So now we're going to have two difficulties with Rav Chista. One is this mission above him. See, it's not. Hashoel tapara. I want to borrow your cat. Now, a, a Shoel assumes all responsibilities, even for Ones. The only, there's only one thing they don't assume responsibility for. If while I'm working the animal, the animal dies, then I'm not responsible, or whatever it, item it is, from regular use, because I borrowed it to use. And, you know, unless I borrow your car, your car just dies while I'm in the middle of driving it for no good reason. Okay? But if it gets into a car accident, I'm responsible. Okay? That's Ones. So, Ashoel tapara. Now, the question is, at what point am I start to be responsible for Onsi? If I borrow your cow, and you send it to me, it's, I haven't even gotten it yet. It's on the way to me. So, it's the same kind of idea. You send it with your own shaliach. Okay. Obviously, if you send it with your own shaliach, right? It's not as if it got to me. For sure, you'd still be responsible. But, if I send my son, I send my slave, or I send my messenger, here's the key line, to get it from you, so my messenger that I appointed, umeta, and then the animal dies on the way, not from use, but dies some fluke thing, ones, patul, even though a shoel is usually liable, I'll be exempt. So now we have to figure out what kind of shaliach is this. If we can prove it's a shaliach with witnesses, that I appointed with witnesses, then that seems to go against Rav Chista, because Rav Chista says if, I, if Naomi appoints these witnesses with uh, the, the agent with witnesses, they basically operate in her place and the responsibility goes on to her. So here, if I do, if I send my own messenger and if I did it with witnesses, I don't assume responsibility. That goes against Rav Chista. I should assume responsibility. It should be as if I received it. So, hechidami, my haishlucho hechidami, what was the case of the shalich? And now we're going to prove that it must be there were edim, that I appointed the agent with witnesses. Idelo asabe edim, we're going to prove it by process of elimination. If it wasn't with witnesses, minayadinan, how do you know it's my shalich? How could you possibly know it's my shalich unless there were witnesses? It's a funny question kind of thing, but we'll see in a minute how it could be. But right now they're going to assume that. Ela dasabe edim, so it must be. How did you know it was my shaliach that you sent the animal with my messenger? It must be. There were witnesses who said, oh yeah, Michelle appointed this to be her messenger. Vikatani patur, and yet I'm exempt. At, right, I'm exempt. It's not as if it got to me, even though I appointed with witnesses. Kasha the Rav Chista, right? Difficulty for Rav Chista. So they say, just like Rav Chista says somewhere else, which we're going to see in one minute, Kida Amar Rav Chista ulekito, just like he answers the same question about from our Mishnah, by saying it's a schiro velikito, hachanami, I know you don't know what that is, I'll explain in a minute. Hachanami, likewise here, will say schiro ulikito. What's schiro ulikito? How did you know it was my messenger when I sent it? Because it's someone, my errand boy, that I always run, you know, send on errands, or my errand girl, right? This is someone who works for me, okay? Doesn't mean I appointed them to be my messenger. It's just someone, why, how do you know it's my messenger? Because it's someone you recognize, because I always send them to do things for me, or they work for me, they're a sachir, they're someone who generally works for me, and therefore, okay, Sahir is someone who I hire, and Lakito is someone who, collect, you know, works in my field. So there's someone who everyone knows is mine, and that's how you knew it was my messenger, not necessarily I appointed them with witnesses. We're going to do the same thing now as if we didn't know this answer, and we're going to bring a question on Rav Chista from our mission, the same thing. It's not, lo yitain lo lebenova lo lishlucho. If I'm returning a stolen item from you, or Ruth is returning the stolen item she stole from Naomi, and Naomi sends the shaliach to get it. Ruth giving it to the shaliach is insufficient. Why not? Right? Well, what kind of shaliach is this? We're going to say the exact same thing as if we didn't have the answer in the previous yet. If, right? How would Ruth know it was Naomi's shaliach if not that Naomi had appointed the shaliach, the messenger, with witnesses? So, el alav das obe edim, it must be edim. So again, tirgamar rav chista b'schiro ulekito. So again, we're going to say no. It means if you send it with the person who usually works for Naomi, and we know can, they're associated with Naomi, but not that Naomi appointed them with witnesses, and therefore there's no question. But now we're going to say, okay, let's read our Mishnah like this. Then. According to our Mishnah then, aval, what, what arises from what we just said is shaliach shasa obe edim mai, hachanami dahavi shaliach. Well, then you're going to say that if Naomi appointed a messenger, to get the stolen item back from Ruth with witnesses, then you're going to say 
But that's as if Ruth gave it to Naomi, right? And then she's done, which we didn't say before. And if we were going to say that, then it should have said this in the Mishnah. What did it say? The only way Ruth can get out of if she stole this item of getting it back to Naomi for the atonement purposes is to get it physically to Naomi or the only other alternative is give it to a messenger of the court. Well, if the other alternative is give it to Naomi's messenger who Naomi appointed with witnesses, should have said that in the Mishnah. It should have specified in the Mishnah like this. Should have told you. Or a shaliach that Naomi appointed, right? That the Nigzal, the one who was stolen from, appointed with witnesses. So Amre, they're now going to explain why it wasn't in the Mishnah, even though it could have been in the Mishnah, okay? Because we have to explain, according to what we just said, it could have been in the Mishnah, according to Rav Chista. So Amre lo psikale. The issue is because it's not across the board. What does that mean? Well, there's two kinds of shlichim. Again, this goes back to the get. There's a shaliach that Ruth could appoint to get it to Naomi, and a shaliach that Naomi could appoint to get it from Ruth. So now we're going to say the following. Shaliach beitin lo shnasa o nigza, lo shnasa o gazlan have a shaliach. When Ruth gives it to a messenger of the court. Ruth could be the one herself to say, I want you to be my messenger here. Of you know, Obviously, it's a court appointed, but it's also who decided this is going to be the one to do it. Ruth can decide you're going to be my messenger, or Naomi can decide this is going to be our messenger. It doesn't make a difference because it's the shaliach of the court. So if it's a shaliach beitin, like it has an official title, either one can appoint them to be the messenger. And that is psikale. And that's why it's in the Mishnah, because it goes either direction. But shaliach, shasova edim, if it had said, but a shaliach that was appointed with witnesses, well, it depends who appointed it. If Ruth appointed the agent, even in front of witnesses, it's not going to help. It's not going to be as if she returned it to Naomi, only if Naomi did. So dechiyas o nigzal, who da havi shaliach. It's only if the one who was stolen from me, the shaliach. But so gazlan, do havi shaliach, and therefore lo psikale. Therefore, they didn't want to say shaliach that you appoint with witnesses because you might think it would go in both directions. They wanted to write things that were clear cut, that were go in all directions and work across the board. Ula fukem, by the way, this explanation we just brought, disagrees with the following Tana, de Tanya Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, where what we assumed is, why is the shaliach beitin in there? Because it doesn't matter who appoints the shaliach. It's as if Ruth returned it to Naomi once that once it gets to the court. Now we're going to see there's someone who disagrees with it. Rabbi Shem ben Elazar says even a shaliach beitin can only be appointed by Naomi, not Ruth. Okay, there's going to be just a, a dissenting opinion here. Shaliach beitin shaso nigzal v'lo aso gazlan. Os, okay, so either the nigzal Naomi appointed the shaliach beitin, the uh, agent of the court, but not if Ruth did. Or Asao Gazlan, or Ruth did appoint the Shliach Beitim, but Shalach Hala Venatala Shalomi Ado. But Naomi sent a messenger to get it from the messenger of the court. If that were to happen, then it would be fine. But any less than that, okay, Pachur. Okay, so if in that case, Ruth will be Pachur. If either Naomi appointed the court appointed, right? Or if Naomi picked it up from the court appointed one that was court that was appointed by Ruth. But again, it's a little tricky to call it court appointed because then it sounds like the court appointed. So it, it would have to be someone who maybe works for the court, but that Ruth decided I'm going to send it with that person. Then again, what does it mean? It means number one, Ruth is done with her obligation, which also means that if something happens to it at that point, she's exempt from responsibility. But if Ruth appointed the court, appoint the court um, agent and Naomi didn't pick it up from them, she won't be exempt. Okay, now that goes against the way we just explained our Mishnah. So there's two ways to understand that case. This shows that it's not psika, it's not across the board. Now we're back to this machloket, Rav Chista Rabba, Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Elazar, the Amrit Ravayu. They're going to side on Rav Chista's side. Shaliach, these are two from Eretz Israel, from Israel. Shaliach shasao be'edim have shaliach. Okay, so they're going to say the same thing. If you want to diff, say, wait, but our Mishnah doesn't seem to say that because our Mishnah doesn't mention shaliach. Well, b'mamtzilo shaliach. Our Mishnah means that if you send with a shaliach of Naomi's, what he means is if Naomi makes uh, an agent appear before you, meaning, what does that mean? Naomi goes over to some person that she knows and says, listen, Ruth owes me money and she's not returning it. So listen. Go appear before her. Maybe Ruth just doesn't know who she can send it with. So go appear in front of her and hope that she'll give it back to you. 
but it's not that, that's what we mean by shlucho in the Mishnah. Not one that Naomi really appointed with witnesses, okay? Just one that Naomi said, listen, you know, go try to get it back. Alternatively, you can explain it the way we just said, which is it was a shaliach, who is just someone who generally works for Naomi, but not that it was an appointed shaliach with witnesses, right? And then you can resolve the difficulty with Rav Chista or Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Elazar. Okay. Now we're going to see that Rav Yehuda sent the name of Shmuel, it's turning out to Amabet. We're back to, again, the whole topic here is not stealing, really. It's giving back loans or things that you owe. So if you owe money to someone, don't send it with someone who comes with a diokni, a filuidim chatumi malat. If you have someone's stamp, okay, their insignia, and it says, it's kind of like what we would call a power of attorney, okay? If they show up with your stamp and maybe even witnesses signed on some document that says, you know, I have power of attorney, don't send it with them. Okay, he obviously disagrees with this approach that, they assume responsibility because he's saying this is not a secure payment. Okay, you assume responsibility till it gets to their house. So don't be duped into thinking because they have their seal that you can do this. For Rabbi Yochanan Amar, in edim chatumim alav meshalchim, kind of like Rabbi Yochanan said, if it was the wit, if the agent was appointed with witnesses, just like he said before, this is if witnesses signed on it, and it's power of attorney that works. Those people take responsibility. So go for it. Send it with them. Amre l'shmuel my takanta. So they say, well, how on earth is Shmuel going to let? How are you going to get loans back according to Shmuel if you're if you're not living in the same place and you can't go to their face? How on earth are you going to get loans back? You have to have some sort of method of secure payments here. So now we're going to get a story. You might remember we had a story recently with Rav Yosef Rachama, who was the father of Rava, and remember Rava convinces him that he made a mistake about something. So now we're going to have a case. Kiyadu Rabbi Abba have a masik zuzei b'de Rav Yosef Rachama. So Rabbi Abba had money in the hands of Rabbi Yosef Barachama, and he wanted to get it back. Amar le le Rav Safra. So he said to Rav Safra, Bahade da'atid, when you're, I see you're going there. So when you get to where he lives, aitinu niyale, go collect my money and bring it back to me. Ki aza lahatam, Amar le Rava, the very smart son, Rava comes along and says, hey, Rava Bere, his son, mi katav lachit kabalti, do you have a, do you have a, a signed document that says, I received my money back, signed by Rabbi Abba? Because if you don't have that, why would I give it to you? I'm going to be, uh, you know, you're going to go. Something could happen to you on the way, and Rabbi Abba's going to say, pay me back, and I have no proof that I paid you back. I'm relay low. So, of course, he says, oh, I don't have that. He didn't send me with anything. So, Rabbi says, go back. Get a, get a signed thing that says, I received my money, signed Rabbi Abba. Bring it. I'll give it to you, and you'll give me that. But Lisof, but then Rava thought more and said, you know what, this isn't going to work. You know what, this won't necessarily protect me. Why not? It could be by the time you get home, Shachiv Rabbi Abba. Rabbi Abba will die. If he dies in the meantime, first of all, it could be he was very old. It could be that explains why he couldn't get it himself. I said before the elderly, it was based on this story. So now, if... You write, I receive this, Rabbi Abba. And by the time the shaliach gets back, Rabbi Abba's dead. Well, I'm going to have to take it up with the orphans. And the orphans will say, I don't know what you're talking about. Our father never got the money. And here it's signed he got it. But he never got it and he's dead. So I'm going to have no proof. So I'm relay. So Rav Safra doesn't know what to do. He says, So what am I supposed to do? So he says the following. You might remember we learned about a Kenyan Agav. What's that? Where you can acquire movable items that are not here. Usually you have to pull them, but you can acquire them if you if you basically sell someone land through the Kenyan on the land, they can acquire also the movables. So what he's saying is like this. He says to Rav Safra, go back to Rabbi Abba. Have Rabbi Abba give you a piece of land. It could be very small, just something symbolic. Piece of land. With that, while he gives you the Kenyan on the land, have him give you a Kenyan on what's in my house, okay? Some people say that this wasn't a loan. This was an actual object, uh, uh, you know, let's say a vessel, right? And he said, have him give you rights so that you, Rav Safra, will be the owner of this item that's in my house or even possibly the money, the loan. And then when I give it to you, it will be yours. And then you'll write me, I accepted this. And then I'll give it to you. But 
Any less than that, I won't give it to you. Ki Hadar Rav Papa, and there was another story with Rav Papa where he did the same thing. It's going to be a bit of a short, shorter story, and it's a story we've seen before. Have a Masi Tracer Al Fezuze Bechosai. He had someone who owed him 12,000 Zuzim in Bechosai. Bechosai is a very far away place, and he just had no idea how he was going to get it back. A Kiminu Niale, Lirav Shmuel Bar Abba Agava Sifa Debete. He took the threshold of his house and said, Here, you take this. This will be owned by you, Rav Shmuel Bar Abba, because Rav Shmuel Bar Abba was traveling there. And with that, you'll gain, here, by, by the way, it seems to say we work for a loan. I'll give you rights to collect my loan yourself. That will be yours. And Kiata, when he came back and he actually got the loan, the guy was, because what did the guy say? I'm not willing to give my money to someone unless they take responsibility. It's a really long trek from Be Chosai back to mainstream Babylonia. And anything can happen. Why would I ever give up this huge sum of money to someone you also have to remember in those days, right, traveling, and there were ro- robbers all over, and people would just take your money. So Kiata, when he saw him coming back, Nafik la'apead tavach. Okay, there's different explanations of what this means, but he was clearly super happy. Maybe he ran out to greet him in the city tavach or something, so happy to get his money back because he thought he'd never see it. So we see here a very interesting, right, which, again, relevant to nowadays, how you pass money to someone from afar and what are secure, right, and how much we're concerned about secure methods of transferring money because we understand, right, what happens if not. Okay, and we saw two different approaches, really. Is there a way to give it to an agent where the agent will accept responsibility? Is there not? And for the people who think not, well, how do you do it? And that's what we got into those stories. Now we're back to the mission. Natanlo eta keren. So it said here, which part of the of the payment you have to get back? The keren, not the chomash and the asham, which we thought meant the chomash and the asham are part of atonement, you and God, and the keren is for the one you stole from. Now, obviously, the Chomish payment goes to the Nigzal, but we thought that it was really, though, for your own atonement purposes, more between you and God. Okay, if we're going to pay it, though, you'll pay it to them. But here, they assume, Alma Chomish Mamonahu. Number one, they say the following. Chomish is not for atonement. Chomish is a monetary payment. I stole from you. I have to pay you the, the Karen. And if I come forth and admit that I stole... I have, you know, if I took an oath and then admit that I lied, I have to add this Chomish payment, and it, but it's payment for you. Now, how do we know it's payment for you? Good question. Where did they get to this conclusion? Um, so Rashi says, and again, there's a whole bunch of different interpretations because it's not really so clear cut. Rashi says from the fact that the Mishnah has to tell you, it's actually like uh, fuch as they say, kind of upside down, but, or long-winded. The fact that the Mishnah has to tell you for the Chomish payment, you don't have to go find the Nigzal, means that you would have thought you did. Why? Because it's a mamun payment. In other words, it's a mamun payment, but in a bit of a different category than the Karen, that it doesn't have to be returned directly to the person, but it is similar enough that we had to tell you that, by the way, right? because they had all these things, if you gave them the Karen, not the Chomish. So the fact that they had to go through all that is because it really is a mamun payment. It's just that we're going to treat it a little bit differently than the Karen. And then the split goes between Karen and Chomish is mamun, Asham is for your atonement. Okay, different than we thought, and that I kind of set up in the beginning of the shear so you'd understand we got here. What's the relevance? The relevance is very simple. It might, if the person who stole dies and doesn't do it yet, well, do you need atonement at that point? No, you're dead. You don't need, you can't do atonement. And as someone can't do atonement for you. So, Mishamile Yorshim, if it's not for atonement purposes, the Asham Zelo, the kids aren't going to bring, it's not their Asham to bring. That's for atonement, and the father's dead. But if the homish payment is mamon, then you'll have to pay it. The orphans will have to pay the money. So that's what we're going to deal with right now. Utsna Nami, we're going to have further proofs of this, that it's mamon and the orphans have to pay. Utsna Nami, natanat hakeren v'nishba l'chomesh, harei mosif chomesh al chomesh, al machum shamamonehu. So if you gave, uh, the, our Mishnah said, if you gave the Karen, and then you didn't pay the Chomesh, and then you took an oath that you did, and you lied, you have to pay Chomesh on the Chomesh. Well, that shows that the Chomesh can become a Karen, which means that the Chomesh itself is a monetary payment. If it was just for atonement, we wouldn't make you pay Chomesh on denying the atonement payment. Next source, proof. Tanya Namihachi, it also says in a bright, Taha gozelet chaverov you steal from someone, you take an oath, and the assumption is whenever it says nishba, usually it means, and you admitted while they were still alive, while, while you were still alive, then you died. Your shame, mishamim, keren, mechomesh, upturim, and asham. Here you have it explicitly. The orphans pay the keren and the chomesh, but they don't do the asham because that's atonement. But the, the chomesh is a payment. 
So now the Gemara is going to raise a contradiction. According to what we just said, Yorshim b'nei shalume chum shadavu on havei, they're questioning now. The Yorshim pay the homage for the father? Really? Urimenu, that contradicts the following source. Adayin ani omel, here starts the source, starts in a kind of funny way. I still say, e matai eno mashalim chomesh al gezel aviv. When don't you pay the homage for your father who stole? Bizman shelo nishba, we're now going to have four permutations, okay? There's the father taking an oath and the son taking an oath, okay? And it could be both, neither, or either the father or the son. And we're going to basically say in none of those four cases does the child pay the homage. That seems to go against what we just said. So, bizman shelo nishba lo hu velo aviv, neither him nor the father swore. Obviously, there's no homage because the father even didn't have to pay it. Hu velo aviv, the kid swore but not the father. You don't have to pay the homage. Aviv velo hu, if the father took an oath but the child didn't, also they don't have to pay the homage. And now they say those are obvious. Huva Aviv, what if he and the father took an oath? In other words, again, what would it mean? The father said, I didn't steal, and then it turned out he was lying, and he said, oh, I did. And then the child said, oh, my father already paid back the money, you know, and it wasn't true. And then he comes forward and says, I lied. How do you know that case, Minayi? Talmud Lomar, also that case, the child won't pay the homesh, even though he denied his father's theft. Talmud Lomar, asher gazav, asher ashak. V'hu lo gazav, v'lo ashak. The child really didn't steal. It was the father who stole. And so the, the child is not the one who did it. When do you pay the homage? When you yourself stole. So whatever situation, the child would not have to pay the homage. That goes directly against what we just said. It all depends on whether you admit it or didn't admit. Meaning, until now, we always said whenever it said nishba, we mean nishba and hoda. Now we're going to say no. It's when you admit, the, the bright that says the child doesn't have to pay the homage is because there was no admission. In the previous case, where we said we had to pay the homage, was when the father admitted. So now they're going to say, wait, something doesn't jive here. E lo hodav. You're going to say that second bright was where there was no admission. Well, karenami lo mishalem. If there was no admission and the assumption is there were no witnesses, well then, why, if, if I didn't admit that my father stole and my father didn't admit that he stole, then why would I need to pay for my father's theft when no one even knows that my father stole? That's, there has to be, right? The assumption here is that you don't pay the chomesh, but you pay the principal. But there is no principal if no one admits. How do they even know there's a theft? So, or that I stole, or that my father stole. Maybe you say, okay, what it really meant is you don't pay the chomesh and you don't pay the karen. Okay, now we're going to say that can't possibly be. The fact that it says chomesh, it means you don't pay chomesh, but you must have to pay the principal. And furthermore, we'll furthermore prove this because you have to pay the karen. Because a dying any omel, it says in a different bright, huh? When do you pay the principal for your father's theft? First of all, if you both take an oath denying the claim, You'll have to pay the principal. Now we're going to go through all the other three permutations. Aviv Elohu, the father but not you. Hu velo aviv, you swore, the father didn't swear. Thank you. It's the next part of the same bright I see Ruth is saying. Didn't catch that. Lo hu velo aviv minayin. What about if it's not him and not his father? How would you know? Talmud lo marag zela ve'oshek v'avidao pikadon yesh talmud. From here you learn all the others as well. Meaning, all permutations you have to pay the karen. So it's obvious here that you have to pay the Karen and you have to pay, and you don't have to pay the Chomesh, which makes it difficult to say that there was no admission here. And then you can't explain Rav Nachman's resolution. Now, before we finish for today, we'll just deal with this one line in that bright to Yesh Tamud, and then we'll, fin- we'll come back to this whole uh, discussion tomorrow. The Yativ Rav Huna the Hashmata, he quoted this bright, huh? Amr Rabbi Bere, Rabbi his son said, Yesh Tamud Kamar, O Yesh Tamud. What did you say at the end of that Brayta? Right, they weren't writing it down. No. Yesh Talmud sounds like Yesh Talmud. In other words, does it read like this? Yesh Talmud. That's a drasha from the Pasuk. And because of the drasha, we're going to say it includes all sorts of other cases because it mentions all this, all this, all that. That includes all the permutations of him and his father. And then you'd have to pay the Karen in all cases. Or is it Yesh Talmud? You have to pay... And it's just saying you have to pay, that's all. It's not saying we get it from a drush and the pasuk. So, Amrle Yesh Tamuk Amr. What I meant is, no, we learned it out from the Pasuk. Umi ribuya de cry amre. And I get it from the fact that in the Pasuk it says 
the Gzelan, the Oshek, and the Avedan, the Picadon, all those things are mentioned in the Pasuk to say it's going to include another four cases, basically. Him and the father, him and not the father, not the father, not him, not, okay, all those four permutations is from a drasha in the Pasuk. Okay, we'll stop here for now and then we'll go back and try to figure out how we resolve this contradiction. So, quick review of today's stuff. We started with the issue of our Mishnah has nothing to do with the Machloka Rabbi Tarfa and Rabbi Kiva, two totally different cases. After we tried to resolve it according to Rabbi Kiva, we tried to resolve it according to Rabbi Ishmael. In, uh, I'm sorry, Rabbi Tarfa, I keep saying Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Ishmael. Rabbi Tarfa and Rabbi Kiva. In the end, we say it's totally different. Rava came and gave us that explanation. Then we did the whole thing about a Shaliyah. We took an outside sugya, which used our Mishnah and another Mishnah above and to contradict Rav Chista, although we resolved it, which was a Shaliyah that you appoint with witnesses does that shaliach assume responsibility? Rav Chista says yes. Rav said no. If he assumes responsibility, so what about our Mishnah? Why not? We said, we also said maybe it's just a case where you sent the messenger to try to get the money. Then we said this, we had Shmuel versus Rabbi Yochanan about if somebody gives you a stamp, like a power of attorney, does it work, does it not? Shmuel thought no. And then we said, well, how on earth are you going to turn loans in a secure way according to Shmuel? And we gave this Kenyan Agav solution, okay, with the land. Basically having the Shaliyah acquire it in a real Kenyan, acquire the loan. And then we ended with this Chomesh. The Chomesh is a monetary payment, not atonement like we thought. And then that contradicts this other source, which seems to say the orphans do not pay the Chomesh, but they should if it's a Mammon payment and we're in the middle of that, re- trying to resolve that contradiction. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Wishing everyone a good day and Besorot Tavot. We should hear good news.